Good day, I'm Bonsert Bokel of Radio Work for Future and writer of the Association of Ishtar. You can find us on www.associationofishtar.com and Radio Work for Future on YouTube. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a multi-talented individual. He's a creator of an amazing world and series, not only from a radio drama perspective, but also a novelist. And from uh, all the way across the pond, joined by the ever-talented and creator of Association of Ister, Bonzar Boca. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. Yeah, doing all right. Very busy, very busy with the preparations. I'm working on uh, the audiobook of my first novel, Wrench in the Machine. The audiobook of my second novel is already done, it's even already published, to my amazement. A lot of work to do. We're getting there. Well, for those that don't know anything about yourself, as the multi creative person that you are, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talk. All right, so uh, originally I came to Two Geeks Talking to talk about my upcoming Kickstarter for Bound for the Sticks. Unfortunately, I do not have a physical copy yet as we're still uh, working on the illustrations, but they are looking amazing. I do have another book that we're bringing, the Arcology Companion. I'll uh, discuss that a little later on uh, what that is about. Yeah, I also have a YouTube channel called Radio Retro Future, where I have a series called the Steampunk Beginner's Guide, which is a doc documentary series about uh, my big passion, steampunk. Comments on that show kind of led me to create a multiverse called the Association of Ishtar, in which eventually the, uh, is that people can insert their own worlds, their own characters and adventures, explore the wide range of steampunk possibilities, so to speak. Yeah, that's what I want to talk to you about. And uh, of course, I hope you'll support it. I've loved what you sent me as well too, and I got to look at your YouTube channel, which is, I have to admit, I've seen a lot of YouTube channels in my day, but yours is beautiful. Your character development and design and the thought you put into not only your photos, but your, your voice as well. You, you, have, you have the complete package when it comes to creating a, a YouTube channel. People really seem to, like, I, I seem to have a very unique voice and I've got people who recognize me just by my voice alone, <laughs> which is very interesting. And it leads to some very strange developments at times where uh, I uh, recently did um, a uh, voice gig, a little voluntary stuff for uh, a game called called Rattenreich, which is kind of this anthropomorphic world with animals in a kind of like World War One with a lot of elements of, of steampunk and other forms of retro futurism tied in. And I voiced the mouse army in the, in the demo version, I will have to add. Who knows? I don't know if that will make it in the uh, actual game. Fingers crossed and, and hoping that happens for you as well too here. Looking at yourself as a creative person, what's the hardest part about being creative with the multiple series that you've been creating? Is it the beginning? The middle or the end of your process i kind of hope it's it's the middle at the moment i've been working on my youtube channel over 10 years youtube was something i always wanted to do for a very long time in the early days i used to be a big fan of the nostalgia critic i not so much anymore but time i really wanted to do something like that and you know steampunk really became a passion uh it used to be just history but i always had this fondness for cyberpunk you know and that combined i mean i like the definition of steampunk as cyberpunk in the past but i didn't really write i'm a dyslectic so if anyone had told me like 20 years ago that i was going to write in any capacity i would not have believed them I had someone you know you really should start writing started doing that and you know i just persisted and persisted and when i did the steampunk beginner's guide i got all these reactions and i talked about writing and characters it seems strange that i didn't do any of that myself uh, i created my first story which was the uh s46 this is the, the foundation of all of my world building for the association of ishtar yeah now she has her own model she even uh, has a, a 45 millimeter miniature that we uh, have developed for our first kickstarter which was a coloring book which is this book over here which was my exercise in how to commission arts and and also build the visuals for the world and develop some of the characters it just has been an ongoing process i've also developed this which i'm very proud of even though it's a very thin book this is some of the stories that inspired bound for the sticks 
how I work. When I started the series, I, I created all these short stories, which are basically files created by an organization called the Association of Ishtar. Uh, that led to the creation of S46, which was my first tryout. We turned it into a comic, which is my learning process of how to create a comic. And uh, I found some incredible artists among the way. This is kind of like my first attempt at, at making like a file graphically. Um, now this book is just files and uh, I learned a lot in the meantime on how to create it. So. You know, it, it's incredible, and I think people like this book more than uh, the actual novel. But before I wrote uh, Bound for the Sticks, I wrote these stories. It's our five stories are included in this, and they are narratives about various objects, entities, characters that you'll encounter in Bound for the Sticks. And uh, one of the things that I found funny when people review my book, uh, The Range in the Machines, the person in the series, this is meant for people who are not yet familiar with the Association of Ishtar. It also contains some of these short stories, uh, which I will now also publish separately. I'm actually working on that right now. And it will also contain two extra stories that did inspire this book, but they just didn't fit in the narrative of the book itself. I have included these short stories in there, but like I said, they're files. This is an example of what it looks like in the novel, but you know, it's not the same as how it's shaped in this, yeah. you know, where it actually has like the old paper print and stuff like that. So I decided to make that one as well. And it's nearly done. It needs to be properly reviewed. And I'm looking for people who want to make some additional sketches because I love sketches. I, I cannot include like the sketches in the final thing here. I can like include some of the concept work, like doodles made by the associates mm -hmm. themselves. I love that type of world building. That's what I love about RPGs where you can just go into the world and find like files and computer entries and stuff. And you know, that that's exactly what this is. You can actually use this during your role-playing games and, and hand this to a player like, oh, well, this is, you know, research done into the subject. For that reason, I also have miniatures. Like this is a seven millimeter version, specially wow. made for me. This is not yet done. I still need to finish the paint job. But yeah, this is the main character of Bound for the Sticks. Igrain, that's a lamp, by the way. It's a very particular item, uh, very unique to the setting that's explained in this book. Uh, well, we really hope to develop, uh, you know, this this world, so, you know, some a world that people want to live in, have adventures in, all that good stuff. What's the most misunderstood aspect about steampunk that maybe people that aren't in the area of expertise uh, understand? Is this related to my last video that I posted? Okay, so how I define steampunk, that it actually means three different things that are related to one another. First, that it can, steampunk can refer to a genre of science fiction writing. It can refer to uh, the aesthetic that people usually know from uh, video games and fantasy games. And then at last, there is like the community of, of costume enthusiasts who depict these steampunk characters. Then there's, there's a lot of emphasis when people talk about it on the Victorian science fiction fiction side. Now, recently I made a video about is steampunk Victorian science fiction. In my own opinion, I think that a Victorian science fiction has a very small influence on steampunk when you actually look at, listen to the people, what are they inspired by. I also have a podcast on my YouTube channel where I talked with over 200 creatives on that channel. I interviewed a lot of people on this on this very topic. Most of them are really inspired either by Disney or superheroes or anime. It's starting to become a growing influence. And what makes steampunk so special to me is this multitude and this homage to archaic science fiction, archaic pop culture, you know? A steampunk authors in particular love to reference like all these forgotten hero characters and literary figures in The Range and the Machine. I uh, make reference to to, uh, the Nyctalope, who is like the oldest known superhero that's basically forgotten. The Shadow has become a bit obscure. Now he's becoming more prevalent again. Even people who are fans of the Shadow never heard of the Nyctalope, even though he might be the original superhero, super pulp character. And also the first cyborg described in fiction oh, um, as an actual recurring fictional character. There's a lot of, of that in, in Steampunk in general, where people just refer to like this archaic pop culture while also referring to historical events that, yeah, people do not know about. For me, very, very interesting. 
they, they are connected. You know, there's a big difference when you talk about like authors and uh, the people in the costume community, like the people in the costume community, they love pop culture. They love their pop culture references. But if you ask them anything about history, they know very little. If you ask like, who is Bismarck? You might be lucky if they know that it was a battleship. <laughs> when you talk to authors, it's very different because they tend to be very passionate about history, especially local history. They often try to, especially when they're from a particular city or town or region, they often love to incorporate that history in their novels. There's a lot of alternate history speculation going on there. A lot of what if scenarios, you know, what if Ether was real, for, for instance. That's like the big difference between, for example, the, the costume group and the, the, the author, the writers. And the aesthetic, all three of them are very much informed by pop culture and history. You know, that's for me is the, the combining factor. That's why the aesthetic can make its way into so many genres, like science fiction, fantasy in particular. But for me, what separates a fantasy steampunk from the actual steampunk, as I will call it, the themes. For me, steampunk is a very thematic thing, which I kind of like try to formalize in the range in the machine. Bound of the Sticks is a very different book in that regard, but it does have those themes are reoccurring there. In particular, it's like a relationship between man and machine, but in case of steampunk also, or relationship to history and progress. Did writing, I should say, Bound for Sticks energize you or did it drain you creatively? Uh, it was a tough book to write. Easier than The Wrench in the Machine, but like that was my first attempt at a real and a book that I actually finished. Did it drain me? No, I don't think so. Like, I'm still coming up with new ideas uh, for that world in particular. The way how I write, you know, I write high concepts. I write very thematic. I do not have, but a lot of aspiring writers do, where they create like a world and you know, then they have like these, all these files that just describe like general ideas and stuff, but there's no real story there. I read something uh, by someone like that. There are interesting questions there, but none of them are answered. And the rest is just, oh, you know, this group wants to conquer the Mushroom Kingdom because they want to be part of the big friends group or something. That's how far most goes, you know, insert your own name. Uh, in any of those three mentions. When it comes to Bound for the Sticks in particular, like it was really an exploration of the city of ecology that I already described in a number of short stories where I discuss like very specific elements. When you write those short stories, at some point they just start to click, even though the connection between them should not be, is not obvious at the start. For example, one of the most popular stories I've currently written is The White Airship, which was uh, kind of like, oh, I want to do something, you know, with airships because, you know, steampunks like airships for whatever reason. It needed to be something that fit in my, my setting. And I was like, you know, let's let's make it a, a supernatural entity. I don't know, it became like a snowball of on a central plot point of the book. And the same goes for Igraine herself. Like when I wrote her originally as S06, she cannot go home again. Her story is that it's a multiverse, there's all these rifts leading to other worlds. And she's a girl from a kind of like cyberpunk world, very art deco. However, they believe that their technology, their super advanced technology is actually magic because that's what they're taught. So. She she comes to the world of the Association of Ishtar, that's 19th century, 1870-ish, and, and she has all these special powers due to her magical, uh, magical or technological implants, but she's convinced it's all magic, and the Association wants to send her back, but they're afraid that if they teach her the reality of her technological abilities, there's gonna be a problem. It ends with it, as the story suggests, she cannot go home. But as I wrote that story, which started with that idea, it was a criticism on Clark Tech and how people put it into their stories, it became very clear that there was was a lot more going on there. You know, her personal story about her being trapped on an alien world in a multiverse that is hostile to people who leave their worlds behind, by the way. So I wanted to do more of her, but I wasn't sure what. Then I started writing The Wrench in the Machine, and uh, if you can see, you can see a girl here. Uh, that is Igraine. Uh, now she's one of the main characters in the series. That was not intended. Even when I started writing The Wrench in the Machine, I had no intention to put her in there, but I needed the character to guide its main character through the story, Igrain became a very natural fit for some reason, even though I never intended that. That's my writing process. That's how I connect all these seemingly unconnected stories into one big universe. And, you know, it all feels natural. People keep asking questions. Oh, but what about this? And what about that? And say, well, I have not yet written the story yet. So you're going to have to wait for me to work on that. It's a world that leaves people wanting more. But also I see a lot in the reviews that it feels complete because you do come from the short stories. Those things are whole and complete 
complete and thought out, I guess makes it a very unexpectedly a very special series to a lot of people. That's the one thing when you get invested into a story or a series of stories or a world for that matter, uh, then you can at least continue on with, with what the author like yourself is creating. And the fact that you're turning it into so many different creative outlets like a tabletop RPG or another series or with your upcoming Kickstarter campaigns, you have a lot of things on the go that people are invested in, but you've also built up a career over 10 years now as well too. So you've put in the time, the effort, and you've been promoting what you've been trying to create. And that's the most difficult part is sticking with it, being consistent. I set myself a question when I started with what I wanted was to explore, like, what is steampunk? I, I would almost call it like black pilling, where, you know, steampunk is this undefinable thing. But for some reason, people keep saying, oh, well, that's steampunk and that's steampunk. So there is a concept of what steampunk is. You know, I have a theory on what it is. You know, there, there are people who disagree with it, but they never explain why they disagree with me. So that means that I'm onto something as far as I'm concerned, you know, because whenever I ask them a particular question, like, hey, how do you explain this phenomenon in steampunk? You know, they never answer that question and take their own definition of steampunk as if that is a rebuttal of some kind. It's very detrimental because when people come into a steampunk group, they don't talk about steampunk. They just, you know, share pictures. Mm -hmm. Basically what steampunk is to them, it's costumes and aesthetics. And it's very hard to get any attention as a steampunk offer because especially when it comes to the costume cult, they're not creatives. That's one thing. Some of them are, of course, but most of them are not. They just want to dress up. The whole thing on what is steampunk then, and especially if you don't know what steampunk is, how can you expand upon it? You know, if there are no rules and how can you fully flesh it out? And that's kind of like what I'm trying to do. That's why I created the Association of Ishtar in part is to like, you know, this is my vision of steampunk. You know, these are the rules and this is like the framework and, you know, you know, you get like a lot of naysayers who immediately will say, oh, well, but you're you're putting a limit on steampunk. So no, you're the one saying that it's just Victorian science fiction and that can it be nothing else? I say no. What makes steampunk so unique is this combination of archaic pop culture and history. If you understand that, then all of a sudden you can do loads of stuff. A lot of them don't even want to have that conversation because, you know, that hurts their feelings, I guess. That's all I can make of it. And it's very sad because, you know, the conversation just dies every time when I try to have this conversation online with somebody, you know, they either stop responding or they just say, well, we'll just agree to disagree. And it's like, Okay. Running a campaign itself is obviously a challenge because it feels like a second or third job, depending on, on what you do. How are you trying to cross promote or at least get more eyes on not only this series, but also your other works through this campaign? The benefit of everything I do is that it's pretty much like one project. I see the Association of Ishtar like an extension of Radio Retro Future, and I have audiobooks uh, on my YouTube channel as well, and some shorts uh, related to the Association of Ishtar. So that's not really an issue. As for cross promoting other artists, I am asking people to make guest posts, you know, relating to their own stuff so they can write on their own stuff and maybe uh, include like something, you know, how it relates to the Association of Ishtar. And I've got some uh, musicians who are in interested and already submitted, you know, and I've got other offers, you know, describing their opinion of the Association of Ishtar as well, so they get a mention on the main page. If there are other steampunk enthusiasts or retro punks listening, uh, let me know. You can make a guest post. It's always fun finding like-minded people, but it's also fun promoting what you've created and what you've done. And of course, the, the void of social media. <laughs> It feels like sometimes you're yelling into that void. You've talked about the fans and talked about the reactions to your series. In terms of Bound for the Sticks here, what was the hardest scene for you to write in that particular novel? Oh God, uh, the hardest scene to write. Well, I always find it very hard to like write the mundane stuff. One of the biggest challenges for Show Don't Tell is just to make the mundane look interesting. <laughs> Often, you know, just transitional stuff. Uh, is, is things I don't like. And also, it's a very alien world, so I have to spend a lot of time coaching the reader through what they should feel, what they should expect to give the proper stage description, as it were, you know, because you're lifting uh, the curtains for a stage play and, you know, what do you see? What's that first impression that you get? And that was like extremely hard. And also when collaborating with my illustrators, you know, that's also one of the reasons why I started with the, the coloring book to, to get 
kind of like a feel for how do you do that especially like arcology it's such a unique world how do you explain that fortunately i found some illustrators who really love the setting who really love the world i've got like illustrators uh, coming at me like can i please make some stuff for your for your for your thing and you know i'm very proud of that fact very challenging to create a world that is as alien well i mean there are far more alien settings i guess in, in science fiction but the problem with science fiction and fantasy in in general is that they're kind of like very attached to their tropes. I notice, especially with illustrators, when they do work for me, one of the reasons why they want to work for me is because it's not the standard. Like, it's either draw a superhero or draw like a science fiction character and you see, like, especially in science fiction, you know, it always is going into the direction of that streamlined no not not ikea but nokia look it all starts to look like this very streamlined mm -hmm. no uh, exterior details and that is what, uh, what one of the reasons why steampunk is probably so popular because you know there's actually character when it comes to the costuming and stuff you know people can make everything that they own their own you know there's no one else who has your steampunk phone for example <laughs> it really tells a lot about the owner in particular with fantasy and you can see this like in, in Lord of the in the latest Lord of the Rings series and, and the other Witcher series rob a LARP store you know that's <laughs> kind of like where the aesthetics are going and uh, the same goes for science fiction, where you have this halo look to everything now. And then there is the association of Ishtar, which people recognize as steampunk, but the characters look, you know, historical. You can barely see it, even on the cover, you can barely see it, but there's a cyborg here being operated upon. And that's like one of the rules that I have with the artists that I work with, that everything looks about like... 90 to uh, uh, 57 percent historical and then it has like some science fiction elements and that's a very intentional move but that was the hardest part to like really get that vision across really get create that vision for arcology and alexander who's my main artist at the moment he's currently working on a wonderful cityscape of arcology which has all these these houses from various historical periods in there also that futuristic tower in the, in the at the center of the city there's also like an archaeopteryx in, in front of it as well all these references and, and there's a story behind all of it and that's very difficult to translate i still don't know how to describe arcology to people and that's a problem of being unique you know <laughs> it's how do you describe what you're working on then people start like uh, comparing it to things like treasure island and i'm sure 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 treasure yeah. island there's an old game back in the arcanum uh, that, steamworks and magic yeah yeah thank you <laughs> i have it somewhere it was a fun game and it was when i was looking at your work that's what kind of triggered us like oh geez this feels very similar i know it's not similar but it feels very similar um, to it has a very similar approach to world building yeah. and i i love talking about arcanum i mean unfortunately the game is too broken to play yeah. on most systems these days i often have this discussion about can steampunk be, be fantasy now there's actually a word for that called uh, gaslight of gaslamp fantasy which is created by Katja Foglio who makes a series called Girl Genius and she's still working at it like 30 years after I think Katja and Foglio uh, I've had them yeah. on the show. They've, they're amazing. Oh, yeah. I really should invite them myself. When it comes to Arcanum, and this is what I mentioned about theme, because Arcanum has really, like, into the history of the world itself, it has those themes of progress versus tradition, and especially magic, which we're kind of like represents the old way versus, like, the modern technological way where the common people all of a sudden get a fighting chance against dragon knights and stuff like that. You know, for me, that is what, what steampunk should be about. And that is why yes you can do steampunk in fantasy but it's about those themes and that is lost a lot of writers the mortal engines has this problem where it kind of presents itself as a high concept world with these moving cities but really when you summarize it it is just another young adult fantasy and that's kind of like the problem western is more like steampunk than most steampunk novels and for me western is a massive inspiration especially when you watch deadwood oh my god you know that 
could have been a wonderful steampunk setting. You know, and this is also one of the reasons I think that it's not really going to happen, that we're going to see a true steampunk series, because the writers don't get it, you know, the markers don't get it, and until we have, like, a solid definition, we will not have good steampunk. I mentioned you about a potential future project, uh, which I hope to hear more about in April, you know, that could be, like, a way in, not only tap into uh, another audience, that is, or a vision of steampunk, this is how you can write steampunk, this is how you can recreate steampunk characters. You don't even have to include the expensive props because that is also something that I heard from people in the industry that are like, oh, you got to have all these expensive props. It's like, no, no, don't do those. Because, I don't know, it just cheapens the setting if you do that. You know, yes, I know the investment is expensive, but if you focus on the aesthetics that way, you know, it, it just becomes bland and uninteresting because all the characters look futuristic. For me, it's that contradiction between history and futurism that makes it so interesting. But, you know, it's got to be a stark contrast. And that is why I say, well, if you draw for the Association of History, it needs to be 90% historical. I don't mean like pop culture historical, like actual historical and like 10% futuristic for that reason, because then you get like that extreme contrast that uh, is, it makes the aesthetic so interesting to begin with. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Against Ranjay Murata, uh, the creator of, or well, the, the designer for Lost Exile. I really like his work. The creator of Ghost in the Shell, he really got me into cyberpunk, so that would be a massive influence. Oh, it was the creator of the Berserk manga. That was also a series I, I greatly loved. I guess, you know, those are the first three that come to mind. So I guess it's one of those. From a professional standpoint, you have been a, a very creative person for the past 10 or so years in terms of building up your world of the Association of Ishtar, as well as your other projects we spoke to, including Bound for the Sticks as well, this amazing novel too. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, I, I still work a normal day job. This is something I, I do as a passion. I mean, I'm, I'm not where I want to be at the moment in that regard. I don't consider myself to be successful, but when it comes to the size for most indie creators that I've spoken to, like yourself, uh, yeah, I can imagine why so many look up to me in terms of following, but it's a very hostile world out there, you know, places like Facebook and, and, and YouTube, they don't like originality. They, they want people to consume one particular type of content catered to them, and that makes it very hard. However, I am grateful for the amount of people that I've met. I'm very grateful on a personal level that I, I, I met so many interesting people. And one of these people is now helping me to bring this into fruition into ways that I hoped of and dreamed of would happen. And now it, it, it could happen. Yeah, and I love the responses that I get. So I get a lot of emotional fulfillment out of it and purpose and, you know, gives me a reason to get up in the morning. And yeah, that is at this moment very important to me and some I would lead to a situation where I could live of this or can, I can work less at the office. That, that'd be amazing, but I don't see that happen for the time being. Personal fulfillment is always fun to have. It doesn't necessarily have to mean monetary. If you can brighten someone's day or you can brighten your day with just a simple phrase or word, then sometimes that's all we need. Mm -hmm. yep. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Difficult question. How do I do a failure? I mean, I don't think that uh, failure is the uh, opposite of success, but giving up is the opposite of success. How do I deal with failure? If you throw everything on a single project or just, you know, one idea, rather, yeah, then that's going to be a massive blow. And I, I've seen like people work on this one, 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 one idea or one thing. And you're like, you're delusional. Um, I don't say it that day, but I, I mean, you, you just know it's not going to, going to work. I, I work on so many things. Yes, some things work, some things don't. And you put it behind you and then you continue and you, you feel like it's been a waste of time. I always try to be realistic. So when, when one thing doesn't work, I've got so many other things to focus on that, that do work and I do want to continue. So I just put it behind me and, and continue on other projects that, uh, that do work. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's their first foray into steampunk the world of steampunk or maybe into your novels they're becoming inspiring writers or maybe they'll start their own youtube channel who knows what they'll be 
creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By putting out content, uh, for one, putting out good content, not focus so much on, you know, contemporary issues, but more on the human condition. I think that's where a lot of contemporary, especially in, in Hollywood, where people make the mistake, you know, that everything needs to be about current politics. Yeah, that just alienates a significant portion of your audience who don't like being preached to. I think it's very important and that's what I do. Yes, there is an influence there from contemporary issues. In some cases, painfully so, especially in the range of the machine, there's a lot of reference there that no one will get even today. I, I'm a student of history. That's what inspires me the most. And people really hold on to that, you know. There are people who really attach to the themes that are in there and, and how relatable that is. So I really focus on what is the place of humanity in the world, you know, and that makes people think. So I guess that's what I would do. I try to make people think, and I think that inspires them. And leaves things open for interpretation and makes them, you know, wonder what it is like to be in that position. And of course, ask the question, where will you be in five years? Very important one. If your life was a comic book or movie or series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Title would be Make It Your Way. Well, I do hate to say it. Bonzer, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You're, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find all of your amazing work, including the Kickstarters, on the internet? The links are down below here. Uh, I'm a uh, radio work for future can be found on uh, most social media platforms. You're also on Rumble and places like that. On YouTube, we are at Radio Retro Future. The Association of Ishtar has a website, associationofishtar.com, where you can find all the links, including to the Kickstarter. Uh, I've made an easy link for the Kickstarter, bound for the sticks, uh, associationofishtar.com slash KS. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. Because I'm only one person, I can only do so much. The podcast is back after 15 years, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And I've been uploading last year's interviews, over a hundred of them, including who we spoke of, Phil Folio, as well as on that list of interviews. And I'm slowly updating the past 15 years of podcasts as well, too. So look for some real historical nuggets of wisdom back then. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.